Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Dialogue. I am so excited for you to listen to this one because we are talking about making big life decisions. How do you know you're making the right decision in a relationship, in a career move, um, in college, lots of big decisions. So tune in, I hope this has something of value for you. Here we go, episode, is it seven? Is it? Episode seven. The Welcome biblical number of perfection. To your own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this better be good. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. No pressure whatsoever. Yeah. Big, big number. Um, so, By the way, thank you for being here today. For those of you listening, we interrupted Shaylin while she was power washing a patio. <laughs> she was power washing a patio. She had debris all over her. I was covered in and debris. And was willing to be interrupted on a beautiful day. Power washing a patio to come do a podcast. Uh, the truth is, you reminded me kindly that I had lost track of time. You would still be power washing. And a I patio. would still be power washing. <laughs> Actually, which no, is your happy place. It it kind of is. Like as much as it wrecks my back, it also is so satisfying to power wash things. It's kind of instant gratification, right? Like you see the results right away, and it feels so good to just blast away grime. And everything's sparkling. It's the best feeling. It wrecks your back and it. fulfills your heart all at the same time. <laughs> all at the same time. It really is such a wonderful thing to do. I, I got to give you props. Like, um, I knew I was marrying a sturdy woman <laughs> when, I, when I married you, but I didn't know how sturdy. Like, I how, didn't know. How did you know I was sturdy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave me a piggyback ride across the uh, wa- uh, Lincoln. Lincoln Memorial. On our well, on a bet. Was so, that our first or second date? First. Yeah. So we were out there and you were talking about how strong you are. I had to because you didn't believe me. Which to be fair, it's a first date, you don't know me. I wouldn't say I didn't believe you. I just I wasn't ready to accept what you said like completely. So you I was I, don't I was skeptical. Me. I was skeptical. <laughs> There's a difference between not believing someone Pure and being and, just and being questioning. I was questioning. Okay. And so you okay. said, Hey, I bet I could carry you across this Lincoln Memorial on my back. And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Cause if I jump <laughs> on your back and you crumble, this whole crowd of people is going to be like, why'd that dude just jump? Why, why did that 220 pound <laughs> dude just jump on that woman's back? I'm probably going to get, you know, attacked. And you weren't taking it over an answer. I was confident. So I jumped on your back and you absolutely carried me across. But what, what I was going to say is I didn't know exactly how sturdy because there have been times like I, I came, I've come home and there's like a new piece of furniture, something very heavy in our house. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, they delivered this. And you're like, no, like you literally carried it up the steps and around the corner by yourself. <laughs> And I'm like, wow. So like, it's it's um. You're I have a- to say, in my old age, now that I'm a decrepit forty, I do occasionally take them up on delivery if it's not too expensive. Yeah. Oh, um, no question. But there was a time in life where you know we didn't have two extra pennies to rub together, and so it was like, okay, you can just barely afford this. Well, piece and of furniture when you're, or you're or younger, you kind of like the challenge, right? You're like, oh, I, I, I'm going to do it because I can. I want to like, see if I can. I want to test myself. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I want to rip out these countertops and see if I can get them out to the garage before Greg gets home. You know, and you hit a certain age and you're like, uh, I've, I've already done proof. that before. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I, I, I know I could if I had to, but now I know what this is going to cost yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm at the age where just power washing makes my back hurt. So yeah. I, I need to, it just lets me know I need to do some strength and conditioning. I'll tell you what, I have seen some very inspirational people on social media recently. I follow multiple accounts now of people that are like, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, there was that, that lady like, like power lifter, 90 year old woman like power lifting like 200 pounds or something. Oh my gosh, she set a world record. I was like blown away. And then there was this um, guy, oh, it's killing me. I can't remember his name. This guy's like 78 and he's doing those like box jumps where you have like a yeah. whole bunch of them stacked up and it's like almost as tall as him. I'm like, what is happening? So I felt very like, I don't know if convicted is the word, but something along those lines. Like He's better tendons than I do, I can tell you that. <laughs> my tendons are okay. It's my muscles that are like, I'm just weak as all get out these days. So I need to get my strength back. Hopefully our kids got 
my muscles and your tendons. That would be yes. That would my, be a yeah, good. Yeah, I haven't had the issue with the muscles much as the tendons are. Yeah. Are, are junk. I can. I mean, I can still. You know, do I can still be bendy. It's that's not my issue. It's the. It's this. That's impressive. So okay, moving forward, give me a quick little highlight recap of your week. Any any highs and lows to report? Not really. It was Man, just I a week. Like, I gotta like look at the calendar here. While you look at the calendar, my highlight was jumping down to Florida for 36 hours with Ella, our daughter. She's 15. She's at that age where. Oh, by the way, she got her permit this week. That yes, was a did. big highlight. We did our first little celebratory drive around the neighborhood. Didn't take out any mailboxes. It was great. Uh, but she and I just got some super cheap tickets on Spirit. It was literally 150 bucks round trip total for the two of us. Um, you know, you, you, the nice thing about Spirit is you can do that. You get those like $38 <clears throat> each way type of, you know, grab one of those every once in a while, just carry a backpack with you, you know, wear a couple layers of clothes, you're you're solid. Um, But it's, it's cool, like making some of those memories with her, you Mm -hmm. know, you, you recognize like she's in high school, the time frame that you have to make some of these memories is kind of slowly that clock is winding down. Not that you can't do things once they're in college, but it's less, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so just trying to make some really good memories with her. So she was super bummed that she didn't get to do anything over spring break. Um, she had come up with a whole plan to like for my 40th to, for us to go shark diving. And she had like done a PowerPoint presentation and everything. And then you and I ended up going for our anniversary instead. Uh, and so she was, she was a little salty about it. So we, uh, that was pretty cool for us to just get to go down, do a quick dive, come right back, you know, fly home like crusted in salt because we didn't even, <laughs> we were checked out of our hotel at that point. Um, but it was, it was a great time. It was really fun. I'm glad you guys, time I'm glad her. you guys did that. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, mothers and daughters sometimes can have series of headbutting yeah. and those type of things and seasons of that. And, yeah. and uh, you know, you guys, you guys are both great communicators, so. Sometimes that leads to uh, conflict and whatever, <laughs> longer, but longer conflict. Um, but I mean, it's I love seeing you guys do things, find that common ground, and yeah. you guys both came back, you know, fired up about life. And yeah, that was very cool. Yeah, it was great. Last and week, you held it down with the boys, which was, I mean, that is no small task. You know, they were great. <laughs> honestly, it. they were they were great. We had a good time. As they get older, you yeah. know, we're able to have a good time together. Yeah. You know, I, I last week actually I took most of the week and studied. So, um, yeah. I, I've got a, my, my cousin, Josh is actually my, um, study partner. Uh, he's like a researcher. He's actually working on his, You're never uh, too old for a study buddy. That's right. Um, he's working on his doctorate right now. So, I mean, he's, uh, what is his doctorate in specifically? Do you know? I believe theology. Okay. But I could be wrong. It's I a didn't good question. know if it was theology or like biblical studies. I know obviously all those things are like in similar veins, but mm-hmm. slightly different. Yeah, I don't know the specific, um, exactly what the focus yeah. is, but my, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. He's amazing because he has all this, like, Greek and Hebrew and Latin knowledge that, like, understanding the original text is such a valuable resource. Yeah, I've learned I've learned a lot from him, just even about context, and, you know, it, it, it helps, like, when you're looking at, you know, something that's 2,000 years old or 3,500 years old to, to know a little bit about the nuances of the culture and the context mm-hmm. that it was in, um, other, uh, you know, types of, whether it's philosophies or other, you know, works of art or style mm-hmm. of writing. Like, the more you can know about those things, the more you can kind of see what fits, yeah. you know, is, is similar today, like what's a parallel mm-hmm. um, today and then what is just way, way different. Yeah. And I think it helps in interpretation. And he's, I've learned a lot from him on that. And just, uh, I enjoy his company. And I just love, you know, we're working far enough out and ahead right now that we can kind of take time and really kind of sit in the thoughts and, and think deeply about things instead of, um, you know, when you're up against the clock, you know, you've got to, okay, we got to get this done. Mm-hmm. And so it's frankly probably my favorite part of my job uh, at this point. Is, is that, um, mm. 
you know, studying and, and, and working on uh, those thoughts and the right way to approach the messages and everything. So I did that last week, and then I got, uh, as a Buckeye fan, I got to go to a Buckeye practice and then to the spring game mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, get, was... get a little glimpse into next year's team. So it any, was a good week. Any uh, big things to share regarding the Buckeyes? Oh, you know. Uh... Mr. Inside Scoop <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I could talk. I could, we could do a whole podcast on that. Uh, let's, do a, let's do a brief overview. Well, who, who are some hot tickets coming out of the? Yeah. Well, first game? of all, I, I kind of went. You know, even just supporting some of the. We, we have some Buckeyes at our church, mm-hmm. right? So uh, G. Scott Jr. and uh, Trayvon Henderson, Travion Henderson, and um, um, uh, Lincoln uh, Kineholtz, and. Uh, I've, I learned uh, Seth McLaughlin goes to our church. So I was there kind of supporting some of those guys, and uh, they all look great. Mm-hmm. We're doing a great job. But then uh, there is a freshman guy named Jeremiah Smith um, who is just, I mean, ahead of his time. I mean, he's very developed, like, in every way. Physically. He's like 17, right? Yeah, I mean, he would be a senior in high school right now, but he's an early enrollee at Ohio yeah. State. So. You know, his, his class hasn't even graduated high school yet. Um, he's just tremendously gifted, like not even just physically, but you can tell he he has an advanced understanding of football. He mm-hmm. runs really good routes. He's uh, he's going to be a handful. And All right. so, yeah, it was fun. All right. Well, that that's a nice highlight. It was a good it was, week. It was fun. All the way around. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I want to run by you today. Okay. A refresher for anyone that has not listened to any previous episodes of this podcast. Greg never knows what I'm going to talk about. I just bombard him with something. <laughs> I just bring it bring it to the table. I, we do it that way, honestly, because I want people to see the way that your brain works in real time. Because a lot of people are used to hearing you speak in a monologue. And so that's why I like that this is dialogue. Because it's a chance to talk back and forth about topics. And for people to hear just some of your thought processes and how you even get to some of the more like, when I say packaged, I don't mean that in a negative way, but like more polished, full thought, you know, full talks, like you would, someone would do a TED talk, it's put together, right? So I like people being able to hear your thoughts off the cuff because I think you're, one of your greatest assets as a human being and especially as a leader is just who you are as a thinker. You're, you have an incredible thought process, and I, I love the way that you turn the prism on things. You think about things from different angles. You have really, like, insightful um, thought processes about things. So I just love that people get to see that. So I just want to preface that before we go any further. I, I absolutely love that. That's been my favorite thing so far, you know, a whole seven episodes in, <laughs> is for people to start getting a, a sense for who you are as a person and the way that you think about things. So one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot over the years and something that's been coming up recently that people have asked me about is decision making, like big life decisions. And how do they go about making those decisions? And what kind of filter, what kind of rubric do you have for making those decisions? I see a lot of people, especially people who did grow up in in some sort of a religious context, are really nervous that they are going to make a decision that somehow will disappoint God. Like, is there this one specific way that he wants me to go, and if I don't go that, I'm messing everything up? And how do I know what that is? Um, And even for people who don't come from a Christian or otherwise religious context, I think approaching big life decisions, where you go to college, who you do or don't marry, things, you know, big moves, things that you do in your life, people are afraid that they're gonna make the wrong call or base it on the wrong criteria. And so it's like, how do you navigate that? How do you walk through making some of these decisions that might affect your life, you know, pretty significantly down the road in in how it goes? Um, And how do you make the right decision for you? How do you even know if it's the right decision for you? Yeah. So. Yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, that's a, 
big question. That's a broad yeah. question. And it was kind of like 50 rolled into one. So you, can, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you can grab whatever piece of that was yeah. like tugging at your brain. But I just kind of wanted to set up the whole context of that. Like yeah. decision making, big decision making in general, I think is really overwhelming for some people. And yeah. so how do you navigate that? Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say too is like th these would be more like, not, not like uh, should I sin or not sin or... Uh, yeah. you know, should I, you know, th it's, that, that it's type what of should my major yeah. be? Yeah, yeah, Where yeah. It, should I move yeah. and take this new job? What, because I think those are big decisions that will affect maybe the next five, 10, 20 years of your life yeah. or forever. You know, mm -hmm. do we have a baby now or not? You know, those are big decisions that will affect your future, but are they morally right or wrong? Not necessarily. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I would, I guess I would start out by saying, I think one of the things that often causes people to be um, indecisive or carry uh, anxiety around decision making is this fear of getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so often it creates a, a paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to think it all the way out and, and think about every possible outcome. And often it's that um, overthinking and, and fear of getting it wrong um, that I think uh, often causes people to just take, take too much time, right? And they stay yeah. stuck where they are. I think, um, I think definitely I wouldn't encourage people to ready, fire, aim. I think you have to, you have to aim and you have to really count the cost of what you're doing. Try to, try to collect as, as much relevant information as you can uh, in whatever decision you're making. And, and I also think self-awareness around knowing what your personal liabilities might mm -hmm. be in decision-making. So um, you, you think about the whole, um, in like carpentry, they have the measure twice cut once, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not a carpenter, right? But I've done a little bit of, of, of those type of things. And my tendency is to measure once cut once, mm -hmm. right? I'd be like, why, why would I measure twice? I already measured once. Right. And yet the reality is I've measured wrong. And, and if I had measured twice, I would have caught my mistake. Mm -hmm. And so I know that in decision making, I have a tendency to be overconfident with my first instinct or the vision that I have. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's go do it. It's, it's right. It feels right. Let's not waste any time. And mm -hmm. so man of action, let's go. Um, I think if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you have measure three, four, five, six, seven, you know, some measure 10 times cut once people like mm -hmm. we, we've all seen, um, you know, that person who just keeps measuring. They just keep measuring over and over again. And so I, th I, I think some people have the opposite issue. They're prone to over measuring mm -hmm. and they just keep measuring 10 times. And it's like, dude, it's still, <laughs> you know, the same length, you yeah. know? And so but they're, 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 this is the fear of action. So I think self-awareness goes, if I have a tendency to underthink it or overthink it, right? If I tend to underthink it, maybe I need to be a little slower and more methodical than, than I would normally be naturally. Mm -hmm. And if I tend to overthink it, um, then m maybe I need to take action more quickly than I normally would. And so I think, I, I think self-awareness is a big key. Um, and then also... I was at an event one time, it was like a leadership event, and um, a guy, I remember he shared a statistic, and it was like the the top CEOs in the world um, have, it's like a pretty high percentage of like bad decisions. Hmm. Like, like they make mistakes, right? They buy a company they shouldn't have bought, they fire somebody they should have kept, they hire somebody they shouldn't have hired. Hmm. Like, like they had this analysis. It was like, and it was like 50%. Like it was something, oh, Wow. yeah, it was a lot. I, okay. and I, I could be getting this a little bit wrong, but basically he was saying like, even the best of the best, like make a lot of decisions that in a sense yeah. are, aren't the best decisions, aren't right. And, and yet, you know, if I spend my life worried about it, that I'm going to make a wrong decision, I'm, yeah. and I'm not talking about immoral things. I'm not talking about Things that are are compromising your character right. or doing something amoral, shady. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about a tactical. You mm -hmm. thought about it. If I knew then what I knew then, I'd do the same thing type mm -hmm. of decision. And you do it and you get going with it. And then I think another key is having enough humility, being humble enough 
to analyze as you go and cut bait on a decision that's not good. Like, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times people end up, they make a decision, their ego's involved, their pride is involved, their self-esteem is involved. And so they keep trying to make this decision good when it was bad. And if they would admit it, they could move on. So I think even like with um, making critical life decisions, mm -hmm. um, you kind of go, all right, uh, let's, let's take, for example, I, I was talking to a guy who um, was, was making a business decision. He, he basically had been working for a company for a long time and he wanted to start his own business. And it was going to require him putting in a bunch of his own money. It was going to put his family at financial risk. His wife was a little bit like, I don't know if we should do this and whatever. And so what I encouraged them to do is they were talking about it say, if we do this, what would be the point financially where we decided to, to, to bail? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if you, you know, if you got a hundred thousand dollars or yeah. something and you go, Hey, we're going to put in 70 right. and, and we're willing to bleed cash down to 10,000 or something. And then once we go nine, 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 we're, we're, we're out. Yeah. Or something like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying that's the right number, but you get the idea. It, at some point you decide even before you make the move, when you would pull the plug. Right. You now have a, a, a sense of, um, you know, a, a, a pragmatic approach that you can, you know, you're, you're counting the cost. Right? right. So, I mean, again, that's that that's scripture. Right. Jesus says who would build something without counting the cost. Mm -hmm. And so you're counting the cost. You, you've got your point that, that you would you would bail. Um, and, and you, again, you talk that out, you get into alignment. I think another big thing too is, especially for those that are married are how are, are we aligned on this decision? Yeah. And like, I remember when, you know, coming here, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, Hey, I don't want you doing this for me. I want you doing this with me. We defined what that meant. Mm -hmm. And if you had said, you know, Greg, I, I just don't feel like it's right. I, I don't, I don't feel like I'm up for it. I, I don't feel like it's the right time. I was not going to drag you uh, into something. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would have been a decision that we had to be aligned on. And, and so to me, that was probably the most important factor was our alignment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, I mean, that, that, that's several things. I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of decision-making, self-awareness. Um, don't be afraid that you get it wrong. You know, you relocate for a job. It doesn't work out. You're still employable. You can get a job doing something else. Like, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, different personality types struggle. Some people are not afraid at all to make a mistake. They just, yeah. whatever, dude. And then other people are very much, they, they live in that fear. Yeah. And, and so I, I just think, don't think of it as, if you get it wrong, it's, it's final. You know, I, I think you go, you understand that a lot of, a lot of the, places we end up we end up in great places but it's a broken road that got us there yeah and, and, and you go oh man I <laughs> I took three or four detours but here I am right you know and yeah. I, I think that's okay I think that I think you got to kind of expect that so that that's interesting to me because I I do think you're right I think for a lot of people the fear of is this the right thing is such a massive piece but when you do look at kind of the grander scale of some of these other people who make and lose millions or, and I'm not, you know, trying to advocate for irresponsibility, but, but you are getting my point that like, there are so many things where people make big moves and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. Either way, that's okay because none of this is fatal and final. And mm -hmm. I think we tend to think of it that way. We tend to think it's like life or death. Every decision is just, you know, it's make or break. And it's like, ah, not necessarily. Like pretty much everything you can bounce back from. Like you said, you, you're still employable. You can go get a job somewhere else. The business doesn't work. You can, you know, get a different job or you can start something else or you can rebuild. Um, you know, you lose a key hire. You can find somebody else. Um, I, I also think, though, um, so a lot of what you just said, I think, is is more in relation to people making business decisions. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on, like, college. Like, there are so many 
you know, yeah. you, I mean, you just talked about or, or relational or whatever, right? Like, yeah, you just talked about some of these, uh, you know, awesome guys that are Buckeyes that are at the church. Like you're yeah. talking about young guys that are in their college days and, and they're deciding what to major in. They're deciding where to try to go with their career. They're, um, you know, obviously for them in particular, it's, it's maybe including the draft and those kind of things. But for everyone, there's that season of time when you're coming out of high school and you're trying to decide what do I do next. And, um, and I think it feels very do or die. Yeah. We, we put a lot of pressure on people to know at 18 what you want to do forever. Yeah. yeah. I, so I think, I, I think it's in the same vein with the self-awareness piece. Like I talked about self-awareness a moment ago around just your, your uh, tendency to take action or not take mm -hmm. action. But I think uh, uh, about really digging into your motives and your fears. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, let's take somebody who is dating the relationship. Maybe it doesn't feel clear like, hey, I definitely want to marry this person or, or, you know, we definitely fit. Like there's something there. It's like, ah, I got enough. There's enough red flags going on here. Or there's enough. I've got some question marks. Is this just me being picky mm -hmm. or is this really um, not the right person? You know, is this, is this not right? Mm -hmm. and, and that can be confusing, right? So you would go, instead of overanalyzing the relationship, I think you kind of switch focus to what is provoking me to want to get married at all? Mm. Like what's driving me toward that, right? And, and there may be something there around maybe you're getting a little bit older and it's a fear of being alone. Yeah. And so you're like, man, I'm afraid that if I'm alone, I'll be tremendously lonely, mm -hmm. that I'll be, I'll, I'll have this sense of devaluing where it's like, see, nobody picked me. Nobody wanted me. Yeah. And so it'll be the confirmation of my, my, my fears of my own value, my own self-esteem. Yeah. It'll be catastrophic. I'll never get over it. So if you start digging into like what you're afraid of, what's driving you to this compulsive desire that I've got to get I do I've got to I got to get a wedding dress I've got to hit that I, milestone I, I got to hit that milestone I, I need that proof mm -hmm. that, that's that I'm expecting to satisfy some deep longing of my soul okay now you understand why you're maybe prone to you know forcing it mm -hmm. instead of being patient because I feel a sense of desperation that if if I don't do this if I don't marry this person now I might never get to prove this thing to myself or whatever it might be. If you were able to see it that clearly, it, and you were able to remove that fear that somehow my self-worth and my mm -hmm. loneliness and everything is, is tied to this decision, all of a sudden it might get really clear. This isn't right. Yeah. That's this is, this isn't right. Or again, back to a major, I'm trying to pick a major. I'm trying to pick a direction. Why are you drawn to that thing? Does it give you some sort of status? Does it give you some sort of, um, you know, sense of self? Does it give you some sort of respect mm -hmm. in the world, in the social strata, whatever it might be? Or is it that, man, I am, I feel personally drawn to that work. I'm, I'm inspired by the work. I love doing that. Like, that's my passion. Or maybe what your passion is doesn't deliver this other sense of respect. So I'm conflicted because I really love this work, but it doesn't seem like it's important enough or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. If I turn away from overanalyzing this major versus that major and I start looking at what are my internal motivations? What void am I trying to fill with this decision? Mm -hmm. What fear am I trying to subside with this decision? Then I might get clear enough there where I can remove that fear, deal with that fear separately than with my major or yeah. with this commitment in a relationship. Yeah. And now the, that decision of commitment or that decision of major becomes yeah. very clear because again, I think what creates the confusion is when I've got some internal compulsion that I don't understand. I think that's really, it's so interesting to think about it that way because you and I have had this discussion before about marriage when you like what you just said about those relationships and about getting married and having the wedding and that whole deal, I think is really valuable because oftentimes I think people get into a marriage and it's kind of like, can this person facilitate a good marriage with me? 
And it's kind of like the two of you are in service to this third party thing right. called marriage. Yeah. And it ends up creating all this conflict in a relationship because it's like, well, you're not servicing the marriage as right. well as you could. You know, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and you forget a marriage is a relationship. You, you <laughs> and, and so you just make do. it a marriage. Like, it becomes a separate entity yeah. that you're like trying to make it good. And it's like when you step back and you go, I, I, you and I have, have said, I, I think you said it really well. You're like, you almost kind of wish you could like be married without knowing you were getting married. Yeah, it's you, just like you, you, you want to you wanna have the type of relationship that if marriage wasn't a thing, the two of you would come, it. you guys would come up with it. Right. Like if marriage wasn't a thing that you would just go, you know, do you kind of want to like, do you want to come live at my house or let's get a house together? Like, I just want to live with you. How forever. much are you paying like, in rent? Like, yeah. We got to consolidate this thing. Because you and I always just love talking. Like, I kind of want to just be able to sit up and eat stale popcorn and talk to you till, you know, yeah. 1 a.m. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, wherever you go, I'm, I'm, I'm going too. So, yeah, like, if, like, if you I get. Yeah, like, I really want to do all of this with you. Like, if you get transferred to another yeah, status, like, just realize I would, I think you. I'd go as well. Right. Yeah. And, and so that it would just be this very natural thing that it's like, no, we really just like each other so much that we want to do life together. And if you're looking through that kind of a looking glass, that kind of a prism at a potential life partner versus like, who can I build a marriage with and have this very, you know, depending on how you grew up, this very certain structure that you think it should follow. And it's like, you're not following the, the marriage structure that I was taught, you know? Mm. And so now you're fighting all the time because you have your version of what you think marriage is. And I have my version of what I think marriage is. And, and neither person is, you know, servicing this third party idea well enough. When you don't approach it that way, when you approach it from that very organic standpoint of like, would I just want to be best friends with you forever? And like, let's just always live together. Then I think it does become pretty clear. I, I, I think this is why one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is to dig into your fears. Yes. And, and it's scary because they're fears for I a reason, <laughs> right? But the more you do that, the less hold they yes. have on you. 100%. If you have a fear of missing out on marriage, you mm -hmm. see all your friends getting married and I'm tired of being yeah. everybody else's wedding and, and I see them with their families and they got these cute kids and they got this and this. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you, you know, or, or again, you see somebody being successful in business yeah. and they, you know, th that fear of missing out, if I can, missing out on what and what's underneath that. Yes. And you can go into all, all of those fears. They lose their power on you. And, and, and again, this decisions start to become a lot more clear. I think you just, your decision batting average goes up tremendously Yeah. because you're, you, you're not, you don't have this internal compulsion that I've got to try to um, fix or, or alleviate this fear with this choice. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what ends up happening is that, that, ends up clouding people's judgment. So they end up making decisions trying to, to you know, quench their fear. Yes. Then actually making really good decisions. Like yes. you got to sort of do that separately. Yes. And if I can get to that place of, of faith and confidence mm -hmm. and, um, again, self-awareness and, and, and from a, a better place, now these other decisions, um, I, I just think they, they tend, to, yeah. tend to get a lot more clear. I think another key fear... Like if we can park there for a second, because I think what you just touched on is huge. Uh, I think there are several key fears that people have, one of them being that I'm missing out on something that everyone else has, right? Or that everyone else is experiencing. Um, I think another one is the fear that I will not be validated, that I will not be seen as valid. Mm -hmm. I will not be respected by the people around me. And so I start basing all my decision making around what will make people impressed with me? What will make people respect me? What will make people see me in this way that I want to be seen, mm -hmm. that I want to be viewed? And so you can find yourself in situations where you are picking life situations for yourself that are not fulfilling, but they are just trying to assuage that fear that, that you know, uh, if I do this, then people will respect me. If I do this, then people will look up to me. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. My parents will approve of me. Yeah. You know, my, my classmates at my 20 year reunion will be impressed. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that's one of the, you know, you mentioned like younger people, right? So yeah. somebody that would be, we'll call it college age, somebody that uh, we'll say early twenties, right? Where you're making uh, career decisions or your educational, uh, you know, secondary educational decisions or uh, permanent um, relational decisions. Mm -hmm. That's one of the tough things about that is because you really are, we, we're fighting for self-awareness all of our lives, but mm -hmm. in that season, you're, you're really trying to sort out um, what, what, I, what I, I was kind of, what was ingrained in me, Yes. what I was trained for, groomed for, uh, what I was told to believe, what, mm -hmm. like I, I'm just starting to uncover some of my assumptions that may or may not be true. And that's the time when I'm supposed that's to make these huge That's the time I'm making these decisions. big decisions, right? right? And that's why I would say, like, I think that's good work to do. Yes. I, I try to, I try to, the best I can, uh, through the God's word uh, on Sundays and through our church, like, try to help people with that journey. Mm -hmm. Because it is a lifelong journey. It is. Um, but but I think once, you know, if you do that work, um, it's definitely helps you be a lot more clear headed yes. about other big decisions. And and so um, but but I think like, you know, making those then that's why that's why I say like, you know, you're going to get some of this stuff wrong. I mean, lots of people major in something and don't do anything they end up going a different route. Mm -hmm. They they have you know again that, and the that world that's doesn't end. yeah that that's <laughs> something I think is interesting about the day we live in now because uh, our parents' generation, grandparents' generation, uh, it was very common to mm -hmm. start at a company or start a job and that's your whole career, you thirty there. forty year yeah. career, and now you know people change four five six seven times. Absolutely. So so I think I think that's a not not that changing in and of itself is necessarily the right thing, but the fact that that's normalized, mm -hmm. that, that people don't feel like, well, I have to get it right when I'm 23, mm -hmm. you know, or 22 or whatever. Like, I'm going to go try some stuff. Yeah. I heard somebody say one time, it was like, try everything you can, and, or, you know, you know, try a bunch of things in your 20s mm -hmm. in terms of, again, career and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. You know, just try a lot of stuff. And in your 30s, really start to zero in on what you're mm -hmm. good at. And in your 40s, really start making a difference. Yeah. And I, and I don't know that it's got to be 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, but you get the general idea, yeah, right? You the, have a, the point stands regardless. Because for some people, that timeline will look radically different. You know, yeah. maybe you will, you and I have had this discussion as well, where for me, um, that timeline has been somewhat interrupted uh, just because of the nature of our family. You right. know, we have two kids with special needs, and so the me being kind of their primary caretaker at this point in my life, like that season is a lot longer for me than it typically would be for someone with a kid. Like your kid grows in independence a lot faster. And so I have not had a level of independence to pursue some of these other things until just recently. It's, it's started to open up a little bit more. Um, and so that was, that's been a longer timeline. I just turned 40 and there's probably a lot of things that I will try and then hopefully start getting good at in my 40s and 50s, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be a little bit different. Um, I will say that is one thing that I'm thankful to my parents for is that uh, it never felt like pressure to pick your thing and stick with it forever from the beginning. Um, you know, when my parents met, my dad was in a hair band. I mean, he was like, legit rocker you know and that was his thing and my mom taught baton twirling and that you know she had her own core and she had started it from nothing and that was kind of her thing then my dad moved on and he was managing an apartment complex and he w worked for Home Depot for a long time and he you know did things with his hands and um, I remember my mom always used to talk about like what her next thing that she wanted to do would be like she she always said she's a very good writer um and so she always said sorry I got something in my eye um she always said that she she's like you know maybe someday like when I'm done being a baton teacher I, I want to like write greeting cards she's like I know that's like a random thing she's like but I love writing the short little meaningful poems and things mm. that would go in it and, and so I always heard that dreaming of 
I will change path, mm. you know, in my later years, 40s, 50s, 60s, there's not an end to it. And so I kind of just always grew up like not even consciously, but unconsciously thinking, That's yeah, normal. you can change a bunch of times. Like you don't have to know what you want now and stick with it forever. What you want now, you might do for 10 years and then it's something else. Well, I, I think sometimes the, the fear would be that um, if, if you pivot, especially if it's a, like a hard pivot, mm -hmm. that somehow those 10 years or whatever that you sewed into this business we're or this entity over or, here, we're completely yes. wasted. Right. And I think, I think rarely is that the case. I think I for the most part, there was a lot of things that even though it may not be hard skills that were direct, directly transfer into your mm -hmm. new job or your new direction, there was a lot that was going on in a lot terms of soft of, skills. Yeah. A lot of soft skills, a lot of, a lot of, um, lessons being learned yeah. that kind of put you ahead over yeah. here. Right. That, so I, I think again, uh, coming back to the, the fear of getting it wrong mm -hmm. early on, I think part of it is going like, I'm, if I do pivot in 10 years or five years or whatever, this isn't wasted. All, all, not only the skills I picked up, but the process I went through yes. is, is shaping me as a yes. person. It's deepening, deepening me as a person. And much of that will be useful yeah. uh, in this next endeavor. So I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry that I'm going to get five years down the road and, uh, you know, that I, I just that literally threw time. away five years. Right. Yeah, I think that's really good. Are there any other, before I pivot and ask a follow-up question, are there any other kind of core fears that you think um, you want to touch on with that? I mean, we've talked about fear of missing out on things, fear of being behind, fear of this lack of respect or validation. Is there anything else that kind of jumps to mind for you? I mean, I, I think looking into particularly family and just even the people that you feel a need to, um, to honor or be a, approved by, make them proud. Mm, yeah. And to go, you know, how much of this is being driven by, you know, my desire to meet someone's expectations and yeah. who, who would that be, right? Well, it, might, it might be a f family member or somebody that you uh, revere or whatever. And I, th I think also there's also connection to, um, you know, at some point you admire someone, at some point you look up to someone and you look at their life and you perceive how they feel. And mm -hmm. so you want to feel what they feel or yeah. you want people to look at you the way that they look at them. Yeah, so you and, emulate that. And so, so it, it's sometimes like, again, a, a, a desire to have that mm -hmm. that can kind of lead you on a wild goose chase sometimes yeah. or that lead you down paths that maybe aren't the best paths for you. Right. And, and, and I, I get that. I think that stuff can be very confusing. It, and that's why I think, you know, having the willingness yeah. to, to dig into that and, and to, question it, wrestle with it, mm -hmm. and try to get clear so that I'm not uh, doing something from a sense of, uh, you know, trying to do the right thing, yeah. and yet I, man, my, my, my perspective was off. I, I think another common motivation that is maybe a little less categorized as a fear, but, um, but is a motivator for some of our big decision making that I see is people who want to honor someone yeah. that's in their life. So, my dad, my grandpa, my great yeah. everybody was a firefighter. Everybody was a police officer. Everybody was a doctor. Everybody was mm -hmm. a lawyer. Everybody. So this is like our family heritage and I need to follow in those mm -hmm. footsteps. Or um, another one sometimes I see is like, I always knew that my mom wanted to do this and she never got to. Mm -hmm. So I'm fulfilling that. Well, you can't live someone else's life on mm -hmm. their behalf. Mm -hmm. And I get it. it. There is a nobility to it. It's coming it's, from a good place. It's coming but... from, a, from a place of love. But, but there is nothing that you can do that will somehow right what was wronged in another yeah. setting or even what you perceived as a wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think being aware of how some of those motivations that are not bad things mm -hmm. um, can also sabotage you and make you choose a life for yourself that isn't really a fit for you. Mm -hmm. It's something that you um, you do out of a place of honor or whatever for someone else. Yeah. And the reality is the biggest honor that you could give them is for you to live a whole and fulfilled life. Yeah. I, I think that's why 
you know, again, what we do as a, uh, as a, as a church community is part of that iron sharpens iron. It's a lot of times, you know, when you get in and you get close with people and you really know each other really well, and you take something like this, that it is kind of confusing jumbling around in your head and to talk it out and to receive various perspectives and to think it out, talk it out, pray it out. Yeah. And, and to, you know, continue to turn it over and it might take time. And then all of a sudden that clarity starts to emerge. But I think where, when people isolate and they try to sort it all out in their heads, a lot of times it, it can be tremendously confusing. Yeah. I've, I've found a lot of value in processing stuff with whether it's a, a confidant or a coach or somebody, you know, or again, us talking it out where, where you, you work these things out and people are able to speak into it and maybe, um, something's clear to them on uh, where right. they're close enough to you to know you, but a yes. little bit on the outside, yes. but all of a sudden they can speak something that, yeah. they, that you didn't see because you yeah. were just right in the middle of it. Okay, so here was my follow-up specifically for people who do, they are a person of faith, they do have a uh, belief in God, and, and you hear them struggling because they feel like um, one of two things, either... I felt like God specifically told me to do this and then it didn't work. And so now they're struggling with like, did I miss here? You know, did, did he not direct me? Did I assume something? And so they feel confused and lost and frustrated or they also sometimes feel shame, feel like they let God down. And then the other one is, I don't feel like God is giving me clear direction. So what do I do next? Because I've always been taught I need to wait until the Lord moves me. And so now what do I do? Because I don't feel like he's saying anything to me. I don't hear him. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people in those two situations? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I I think every sincere follower of Jesus wrestles with that at some point, right? Um, Okay, so let's start start by just calling some stuff out. Okay. Okay. communicating with God who's a spirit is confusing Mm -hmm. and you're not going to bat a thousand. So, so let's compare it to, let's start with this. You and I have been married for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, we are together all the time, pretty much every day. We talk a lot. Uh, I know you really well. You know me really well. Most of the time I'm pretty clear in our communication. I know your facial expressions. I know, why you're not saying what you're not saying. I know, like, I could teach a whole class on communicating with you. Yeah. We both speak English. We have physical presence. Mm -hmm. So I can read your body language. I can read your eyes. Mm -hmm. The whole deal. And I can speak articulately and directly to you. A hundred percent. And we still miscommunicate. Yeah. (laughs) Quite often. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We still don't hear what's being said yes. or hear what's not being said. Right. So if that's the case, how much more am I going to at times miscommunicate with God who's not physically sitting with me, mm-hmm. who's not speaking in an audible English right. voice? <laughs> I'm, I'm dealing with impressions that I'm getting in my spirit. Mm-hmm. I'm reading God's word and, and really trying to contextualize his heart yeah. to my reality. Mm-hmm. I've got the Holy Spirit that's, okay, working in me. But again, that, everybody's dealing with trial and error when it mm-hmm. comes to that. So whatever you do, don't conclude that if I'm a little confused by these messages I'm getting from God, it's because he doesn't like me or it's my fault. If I was smarter or I was more spiritual, I would just be dialed in. Yeah. Bible characters and every (laughs) Christ-loving, spirit-filled person you know miscommunicates Mm. and misunderstands from time to time. So let's let's not have this be catastrophic. I think a big part of it, and sorry to be, I don't want to be overly repetitive, but if I can know what my fears are and I can be self-aware, it helps me know where I'm prone to confirmation bias. Mm. In other words, Ooh. if I want the thing to be true, yeah. if I want the thing to be right, and That's I'm driving really down the road and I hit five straight green lights, yeah. I go, therefore, 
man, I, I really wanted to move to that new city. I passed a billboard and, with that word on it. And I prayed, yeah. Lord, uh, give me a stop or a go. And then I drove and I hit three green lights up. Oh, you know what? Right. We're moving to California. Yeah. So again, what, what am I? I'm, I'm prone to confirmation bias because mm-hmm. I want it so bad. Well, why do I want it so bad? Because it'll validate me. Yeah. So, so I think the more we can get that and sort of purge ourselves of our, our confirmation bias, our preconceived notions, and really kind of come with a blank slate, yeah. now I don't have noise drowning out really the voice good. of God. By the way, yeah. we've been in Matthew 4, which is this, you know, Jesus in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. What I didn't mention in the message when we were talking about fasting, okay, I was talking about getting your appetites under control. But part of what happens when I get my appetite under control is my, the, the volume of my appetite mm-hmm. gets quiet and I can hear God's voice more clearly. Yeah. Whatever appetite I have, whether it's, it's power or pleasure or whatever, even food can drown out. It's, it's, it's like appetites have voices. Yeah. And those voices have volume. And the more I'm, I'm overindulging or being controlled by that appetite, it's like it's over-talking. Mm-hmm. It's talking loud. It's yelling. And by fasting physically or, in a sense, uh, stepping away from that appetite, mm-hmm. I'm quieting the volume of that appetite voice because what does the appetite do? It, gets com- it, it, it makes me prone to confirmation bias. Yeah. It, it, it keeps yelling for me to satisfy it. So then I'm, again, prone to indulging what I want to do and not really even tuning into the voice of God. So I think bringing those volumes down now kind of opens me up to be more objective to maybe something God might be saying to me that's different than what I want to hear right now. Yeah. So dealing with the fear, um, bringing the volume of the appetite down, I think again, makes me more receptive to, to what God might be saying that I may not want to hear. Yeah. Two, two things real quick. Number one, um, for those who may not follow one church directly but are listening to this podcast, this is a series that you're in right now. It's in April of 2024, uh, so they can go and find it um, at one dot church if they want to get a fuller understanding of what you've talked talked about just now. Because it's called I, Fighting Temptation. Fighting Temptation, yep. because I think that series is actually really, I mean, just so laden with golden nuggets. Like, it's incredible. I mean, I I was, like, shouting you down the other day because it was so good. Um, but then uh, second thing uh, is that is such practical life advice, no matter what you're dealing with. I remember listening to... Um, actually another podcast recently uh, where someone was talking about their struggle with alcohol and how basically exactly what you were just saying, that appetite was so loud in their life that they couldn't think about and focus on other things. And so removing that and finding sobriety, they were able to finally have the headspace and, and the the voice coming down low enough that they could face some of the fears head on, that they could deal with some of those things. It was really honestly just incredible how perfectly in line with what you're saying that is, because I think we have a lot of things that can become a loud voice in our life and take over and and be an appetite that is over talking everything else. And so if you if you notice something in your life is taking over and consuming your thought processes. And it can be things that are morally neutral or things that are inherently bad for you. Um, But if you see those things taking over your thought process, find a way to get that under control, whether it's cutting something out entirely, dialing it back, whatever you need to do, um, so that you can get to a place where you can think clearly and have that open head space. Yeah, it's not about legalism. It's not about right. making God like you more yeah. or trying to, again, get, get him uh, on your side. He's mm-hmm. on your side. Right. He likes you plenty, right? He loves you <laughs> yeah. fully. Um, it, it really gets down to it. It would be like being outside and I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you a message and yeah. you can't hear me because the music's blaring. Yes. And you'd be like, hold on a second, man. Turn the music down. Music comes down. 
and now you're able to tune yes. in. So, yeah, so if something really in good. your life is, it, it has your affection, it has your attention, it's drowning out other voices. And I think mm -hmm. by reducing those, now all of a sudden, I can hear what God's trying yeah. to say to me. I can hear, That's really uh, and good. again, especially if it's something that maybe I don't want to hear, maybe it really is taking me a direction I wouldn't take myself and that I might in my flesh be resistant to. Um, I think mm -hmm. by, by reducing that volume, it's tremendously helpful. So, but I think even at that, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going you're gonna to miss it. I, th I think what I try to do the best I can is have my appetites under control. I try to get to the heart of my motives um, as best I can in that mm -hmm. fight for self-awareness. I try to really tune into God's word and understanding what God values and who he is and how he thinks. Be, being in his word, again, it isn't even about um, trying to make him happy. It's being in his presence, mm -hmm. because when I do that, again, it's like being in your presence, I pretty much know how you would react in most situations. I know what you value. I know how you think. And so, by again, by digging deep into God's word and not just taking what's on the surface, but going underneath mm -hmm. and all of that, now what does it do? It, it, it starts to get my mind aligned to his mind, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it aligns my heart to his heart. And so now in decision making uh, or, or the thoughts I have and like, Lord, was that from you or was that from me? I, I start to become more calibrated mm -hmm. to, to his heart. And so what would you say to the people who go, I felt like God told me to do this and I got it wrong. What do you say to them? Yeah, I would say, I would say get, first give yourself grace. Like don't, don't like I, I think falling into shame for that, like mm -hmm. going, man, I'm so stupid or, you know, maybe getting upset with God or, or whatever, whether I, I, I get angry with him or I'm uh, in despair with myself. I think that's get out of that as quickly as you can. Just understand like that's part of the process mm. of following Jesus. And part yeah. of that, like I'm in the process of learning. I think the more you can not be bound in shame and then start to analyze, go backwards. And, and again, I think that's what happens when you, when, when you don't feel shame about it, you're more likely to go mm -hmm. and be objective about what, what in the world just happened. So now I think you can go back and go, where did I miss it? What was I ignoring red flags? Um, did I fall into confirmation bias? Like, you can really kind of go back to the scene and look at it, you know, way more objectively. And then I think all of those learnings can now be applied yeah. uh, into my present and yeah. into my future and to know where I'm prone mm -hmm. uh, to, to missing it, you yeah. know? And, and, and I think you just, you got to see that as part of the learning. It's again, it, think of it in human relationships, like in t over 20 years, like I fell in love with you day one, I committed to you inside of a year. And we were fully married uh, within six months, Se yeah, seven, seven months. months, right? <laughs> we were fully married. We're not more married now right. than we were married then. We're <laughs> much more married, but we yeah. have a more full marriage now yes. because I know you better. Right. Because of a bazillion conversations, right. miscommunications mm -hmm. galore, uh, mistakes. But we just continue to evaluate those mistakes, mm -hmm. rebound from those mistakes, and apply the learnings to the future. Mm -hmm. Same with God. Yeah. He's committed to you. You're committed to him. There's going to be miscommunications along the way. It's not reason for shame. It's not something to cascade and fall and spiral. Yeah. It's something to analyze with no shame and to apply to your future. And guess what happens? The relationship becomes more and more full. Yeah. Even though you were fully saved, just like we were fully married, our relationship gets becomes more full the more that we do walk through those mistakes. Mm -hmm. And those things are inevitable, man. Yeah. They're inevitable. Just keep taking each one of them, learn from them, and apply that to your next season. I think the other thing that's really cool in that context to remind yourself of is even if something wasn't quote unquote the right decision the way you thought it was, you can't convince me that something good didn't come out of it. If you go into a situation with a pure heart, the right intentions, you're trying to go put good into the world, you're trying to be obedient, you're trying to make good decisions, then something beautiful will have come from that season. Definitely. You will have valuable lessons learned. You will have put good into the world. Um, that, that's, and, by the way, the, at the heart of 1 Corinthians 13, where it says love never fails. Yeah. 
right? Love never fails. Well, what do you mean love never fails? Because people love and in a sense, relationships die or right. there's failure along the way. But essentially, again, when you're, you're doing that right thing for the right reason, yes. that, that, that does go and do more than even you might see yes. that it does. I agree. I agree. Just because something doesn't last forever and maybe it was a just a, a short season, it didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to, you know, in that work situation, that move, that whatever, it doesn't mean that good didn't come from it. Permanent good. Mm -hmm. Even though this was temporary, the good that came out of it was permanent and continu continues in perpetuity beyond, like you said, oftentimes even what you're ever aware of. Yeah. Well, you know, you did something yesterday. So we were, we were at the end of the day, we were uh, sitting in the Adirondack rockers <laughs> and we were, we were talking. And at one point, you know, you were talking through some frustrations yeah, and, and, and some things that felt like failure or felt like it wasn't going mm. the way you'd want it to. And then you flipped it and cause you're, you're actually at one point, you, even it kind of stirred your emotions. Like you were mm -hmm. like, you starting to cry. Right. And, mm -hmm. and you were talking about how you were feeling and then not in some weird, like denial of, um, sorrow type of way, no. but you're like, Hey, let me flip for a second and look at the other things that are going on. And it, you really started to look at like in the middle of things that feel like failure, mm -hmm. you were like, here's what did work and here's yes. what's going right. And it absolutely rounded out your perspective. It, it wasn't a denial of no, the hard feelings or the hurt feelings. It gave yes. you a more whole perspective. So I think like, it's not about putting my head in the sand and going, Oh no, nothing bad's going on. It's all good. Too blessed mm -hmm. to be stressed. All this. I think it's, it's, it's a more whole perspective, which mm -hmm. is a more mature perspective, yeah. which I think, again, informs your future better than picking all bad or all good. Yeah. Well, thank you for that conversation. That was great. I, I just listened. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You just, you didn't have anything to add. <laughs> That was fantastic. And that's, like I said, that's why I want people to hear your thought processes, because I think you have fantastic insight and, uh, you're a very deep and thorough thinker and you're an outside of the box kind of guy. And I appreciate people getting to hear your, your mind and your heart week after week. So thanks for making time to do this. Oh, by the way, when I said, I just listened, I thought you were talking about at, um, on, in the Adirondack Rockers. Oh. I didn't think you were talking about this one. <laughs> no, I, cause I, I did. I probably talked too much in this one, but no, you I, talked yeah. the exact right amount. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> that was perfect. But no, and thank you for last night too. Yeah. Cause that, that was super helpful. It, it is, uh, that is one of the huge benefits of our, I won't say, I won't say marriage since we just, <laughs> uh, but, but of you being my forever best friend <laughs> that I choose to live with no matter what, uh, is that you are a great listener and, and it's awesome to be able to just sit and process real life with you. I, I appreciate that. So thank you You're welcome. for that and for this. Same here. All right, same time next week. Let's do it. All right, see you later. See ya.